Welcome back to the second part of PAX Chapter 2. If you are in my class and you have the novel that was sent out, we are um, near the bottom of page 15. We are about to start the fourth paragraph on the page. A coyote howled. I'm sorry. A coyote, a coyote howled then. So nearby it made Peter jump. A second one answered, and then a third. Peter sat up and slammed the window shut, but it was too late. The yips and howls and what they meant were in his head now. Peter only had two bad memories of his mother. He had good ones, too, and he often took those out to comfort himself, although he worried they might fade from too much exposure. But the two bad ones he'd buried deep. He did everything in his power to keep them buried. Now the coyotes were being in his head, unearthing one of them. When he'd been about five, he'd come upon his mother standing dismayed beside a bed of blood-red tulips. Half of them were standing at attention, and half of them splayed over the ground, their blossoms crumpling. A rabbit got them. He must think the stems are delicious, that little devil. Peter had helped his father set up a trap that night. We won't hurt him, will we? Fine, we'll just catch him and drive him to the next town. Let him eat someone else's tulips. Peter had baited the trap himself with a carrot and then begged his father to let him sleep in the garden to keep watch. His father had said no, but helped him to set an alarm clock so that he'd be the first to awaken. When it went off, Peter ran to his mother's room to lead her outside by the hand to see the surprise. The trap lay on its side at the bottom of a freshly scraped crater at least five feet across. Inside was a baby rabbit, dead. There wasn't a single mark on its little body, but the cage was scratched and dented, and then the ground all around clawed to rubble. Coyotes, his father said, joining them. They must have scared it to death trying to get in, and none of us even woke up. Peter's mother had opened the trap and lifted out the lifeless form. She held it to her cheek. There were just tulips, just a few tulips. Peter found the carrot. One end nibbled off and threw it as far as he could. Then his mother had placed the rabbit's body in its cupped palms and gone to get a shovel. With a single finger, Peter had traced its ears, unfurling like ferns from its face and its paws, miraculous tiny, and the soft fur of its neck slick with his mother's tears. When she returned, his mother had touched his face, which burned with shame. It's okay, you didn't know. But it wasn't okay. For a long time afterwards, when Peter closed his eyes, he'd seen the coyotes, their claws raking the dirt, their jaws snapping. He saw himself where he should have been, keeping watch in the garden that night. Over and over, he saw himself doing what he should have, rising from his sleeping bag, finding a rock and hurling it. He saw the coyotes fleeing back in the darkness, and he saw himself opening the trap to set the rabbit free. And with that memory, the anxiety snake struck so hard it stunned Peter's breath out of him. He hadn't been where he should have been that night. The coyotes killed the rabbit, and he wasn't where he should be now. He gasped to fill his lungs and sat bolt upright, and he tore the photo in half and then in half again and pitched the pieces under the bed. Leaving Pax hadn't been the right thing to do. He jumped to his feet. He'd already lost a lot of time. He fished some cargoes, a long-sleeved camouflage t-shirt, a fleece sweatshirt from his suitcase, and then an extra set of underwear and socks. He stuffed everything into his backpack except the sweatshirt, which he tied around his waist. Jackknife in his jeans pocket. Wallet. He debated for a moment taking between his hiking boots and sneakers and decided on the boots, although he didn't put them on. He looked around the room, hoping to find a flashlight or anything resembling camping equipment. The room had been his father's when he was a boy, but aside from a few books on the shelf, it was clear his grandfather had cleaned all his things out. The cookie tin had seemed to surprise him, like an oversight. Peter bumped his fingers over the spines of books. An atlas. He pulled it down, amazed at his luck, and he flipped through it until he came to a map that showed the route he and his father had traveled. You'll only be 300 miles away. His father had tried to bridge the silence of the drive a couple of times. I get a day off, I'll come. P 
Peter had known it would never happen. They don't give days off in war. Besides, it wasn't his father. He was already missing. And then he saw something he hadn't realized. The highway snaked around a long range of foothills, and if he cut straight across those, instead of following the highway, he could save a lot of time, plus reduce the risk of being caught. He started to rip out a page and realized he shouldn't leave his grandfather such an obvious clue. Instead, he studied the map for a long moment and then replaced the atlas on a shelf. 300 miles. It looked like he could shave off 100 of them by taking the shortcut. So say around 200. If he could walk at least 30 miles a day, he could make it in a week or less. They left packs at the head of the access road that led to the ruins of an old rope mill. Peter had insisted on this road because hardly everyone, anyone had ever used it. Pax didn't know about traffic and because there were woods and fields all around. He'd go back and find Pax there waiting in seven days. He wouldn't let himself think about what might happen to the tame fox in those seven days. Nope. Pax would be waiting at the side of the road, right where they left him. He'd be hungry for sure and probably scared, but he'd be okay. Peter would take him home and they would just stay there, let someone try to make them leave this time. That was the right thing to do. He and Pax, inseparable. He glanced around the room again, resisting the urge to just run. He couldn't afford to miss anything. The bed. He pulled the blanket off, rumpled the sheets, and punched the pillow until it looked like it was slept on. From his suitcase, he took out the picture of his mother he kept on his bureau, the one taken on her last birthday, holding up the kite that Peter made for her and smiling as if she'd never had a better present in her life, and slid it into his backpack. Next, he pulled out things of hers that he kept hidden in the bottom drawer at home, her gardening gloves still smudged with the last soil she'd ever lifted, a box of her favorite tea which had, once, had long ago lost its peppermint scent, the thick candy cane striped knee socks she wore in winter. He touched them all, wishing he could take everything back home where it belonged and then chose the smallest of the items, a gold bracelet, with an enameled phoenix charm she wore in every day, and tucked it in the middle of his backpack with the photo. Peter surveyed the room one last time, and he closed his baseball and glove, and, I'm sorry, he eyed his baseball and glove and crossed to the bureau and stuffed them in his backpack. That didn't, they didn't weigh much, and he'd want them when he was back home. Besides, he just felt better when he had them. He eased the door open and crept to the kitchen. He set the backpack on the oak table, and in a dim light from the stove, he began to pack supplies. A box of raisins, a sleeve of crackers, and a half-empty jar of peanut butter. Packs would come out of hiding, of any hiding spot for peanut butter. From the refrigerator, he took a bunch of string cheese sticks and two oranges. He filled the thermos with water and hunted down drawers until he found matches, which he wrapped in tin foil. Under the sink, he scored two lucky finds a roll of duct tape, and a box of heavy-duty storage Sorry. A roll of duct tape and a box of heavy-duty storage bag, garbage bags. I can't speak anymore. Sorry. A tarp would have been better, but he took two bags with gratitude and zipped the pack. Finally, he took a sheet of paper from the pad beside the phone and wrote a note. Dear Grandfather. Peter looked at the words for a moment, as if they were foreign language, and crumpled the paper up and started a new note. I left early, wanted to get a good start on school. See you tonight. He stared at that page for a while, too, wondering if it sounded guilty as he felt. At last, he added thanks for everything. Peter placed the note under the salt shaker and slipped out. On the brick walk, he shrugged on his sweatshirt and crouched to lace his boots. He straightened up and shouldered his backpack, and then he took a moment to look around. The house behind him looked smaller than it had when he'd arrived, as if it were already receding into the past. Across the street, clouds scudded along the horizon, and a half-moon emerged, suddenly emerged, brightening the road ahead. All right, that is the end of Chapter 2. I hope you enjoyed it.